Okay, so the return of the uh, invisible committee. Apparently, uh, it's not uh, as invisible as you might think. So, um, please uh, set the stage with a huge applause. <clears throat> All right, uh, good Abend. I will do in uh, 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 English expression, while my Deutsch is sehr schlecht. Uh, so, I will speak in English. Uh, all right, first of all, I'm, I'm kind of sorry in advance because my, my speech is kind of long and somehow complicated and the fact that I have to give it in, in English gives me a little room for improvisation, so I will probably have to read a lot of uh, uh, the, the, the notes uh, that I've taken. Um, so, um, to start I would like to, to, um, to uh, apologize for the weird title and, and of our speech and, and of the title of the speakers. Actually, we just wanted uh, uh, to have an invisible committee, fuck Google, Tornock 9 to appear somewhere so that uh, our potential allies and, and friends uh, uh, can spot it out and figure out uh, what this all will be about. Um, so, uh, to start, I will clarify the, the, the place from where I speak. Uh, it has probably no, not that much interest, besides for the German undercover who police who might probably be here texting French undercover police. Um, uh, so uh, I, I'm part of uh, uh, some people who've been called by the media as a Tornak 9. Um, basically, the, the stories I will make really short, but just so that you understand the, the, the reason why it, it makes sense to, to speak here. Uh, six years ago, we got uh, uh, arrested on some terrorist charges in France. So. Um, and basically, the French police accused us of many, many, many different things, from, from organizing riots, from... Uh, uh, bombing uh, a recruitment center in New York and for sabotaging uh, a train against uh, nuclear transport and all kind of things which most of uh, uh, were just not true. Um, and basically they, 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 their, main concern, their main concern was that we will belong to some kind of international revolutionary conspiracies that will just be willing to destroy uh, Western civilization. Uh, but, uh, but they also accused us of one thing that is actually important, that the reason why, why somehow we can, we can speak here, uh, is that they accused us of having written a book, uh, which uh, is called in English, The Coming Insurrection. Um, this book became some kind of bestseller in France because of uh, the big media things that was uh, around our arrest. Uh, and also somehow in the US when uh, uh, Fox News, Glenn Beck uh, just managed to try to read it and, and uh, uh, figured out that uh, it was uh, the biggest threat to American uh, uh, peace uh, at that moment. Uh, and so, uh, so here's the point. Uh, of course, I, I'm not, of course, speaking on behalf of the Invisible Committee. Uh, I'm neither a, a member, a representative, or whatever. Uh, for the very fact that the, in the Invisible Committee is a, is a plane on which to try to think strategically and politically uh, the, the, the current situation. Just like somehow Anonymous will, will be some plane for, for tactical and strategical uh, type of, uh, types of, of attack. Um, so for that matter, there is no inside nor outside, no membership nor, nor authorship. It belongs to no one and everyone, just like Anonymous, for instance. Uh, so the question is, uh, why it is me basically coming to speak? It's just because there's this funny, this funny thing where uh, the police in France have, have tried really hard for years to, uh, to, uh, to prove that we would have written this book. Uh, and somehow they failed so much that we can somehow assume to travel to the world and just discuss uh, the content of it, just as good readers of it. Um, <clears throat> and so then there's the question of why coming here to the CCC to speak. Uh, the reason is, uh, uh, is, um, is actually pretty simple. The, the, the answer is, uh, is Jeremy Hammond, uh, who rots in jail right now, as I guess most of you uh, know, um, and to my dedicate this speech, um, of course. Uh, when <clears throat> and, and actually, there's a, there's a new book by the Invisible Committee, which is called To Our Friends, which is uh, published in France for a few weeks and was going to be published in, in Germany and in, in the U.S. soon. Uh, and uh, there's a whole paragraph in it uh, uh, about, let's say, the hacker cybernetical uh, uh, movement. 
And, and it was stuck as some kind of uh, answer to, uh, to, uh, to Jeremy Hammond uh, uh, act. Basically, when, when, when Stratfor was hacked, uh, the website was defaced, and one could read uh, the coming insurrection uh, on the scroll roll uh, uh, instead of their, of their index. And so we, we interpreted that, uh, this gesture, as some sort of call, as a, an invitation to discuss what is happening politi politically uh, in the hacker milieu. So our presence here uh, uh, is some kind of answer to that call, or at least our contribution to the debate, to the political debate uh, that is going on within uh, uh, this computer and hacker milieu. Mm. Sorry. Mm. So just to go back to the Stratfor thing, uh, to many of us who, who were not necessarily uh, uh, really uh, close to the, to the hacker world, uh, this, this hack of Stratfor uh, uh, by uh, anonym, Anonymous and Antisec, uh, it, it meant a lot. It meant a lot politically, symbolically, and practically. While at that moment we might have had the feeling that uh, 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 Anonymous' main uh, uh, targets were uh, the poor Church of Scientology, uh, and that sometimes it was a little bit uh, uh, politically confused, this attack on Stratfor uh, really seemed like changing the deal. The target was perfect. Stratfor is just the, 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 the twin of the CIA, the private twin of the CIA. The skills seemed to be uh, impressive from what we could get from them. And basically stealing Stratfor clients' money to give out on Christmas was actually really funny. Uh, and of course, we don't have to wonder why the FBI put so much energy in trapping Hammond and others uh, using uh, Sabu and, 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 and using this type of... Uh, of uh, of uh, infiltration that, uh, that we all know of now. Uh, we can bet that if it was a mere DDoS attack, they wouldn't have cared so much. The police, I mean. Uh, but what, what made uh, uh, anti-sex such a threat in the eye of the, of the US police, we can guess, is that they were obviously brilliant, angry, determined, and with a huge sense of humor, which is something that you're really forgiven for. Uh, but anyway, uh, what, uh, what uh, this attack embodied is that for the hacker, uh, uh, you whether work for security, for government and domination, or you fight against it. So there's actually uh, very little room in between. And all those who walk down the path of hacking now uh, know, uh, a lot of them know that, uh, and they're paying the price for it, which is uh, most of the time police harassment and, and, and jail. Mm. But despite uh, uh, what we could see, the meaning we could see uh, uh, behind this, uh, this uh, uh, let's say, seriousness in the attack against Stratfor, uh, it still seems that there's some kind of like confusion that ranks into the hacker world, uh, uh, like politically. And maybe we can we can think that uh, uh, the reason why uh, there's still some confusion uh, is because no one, even maybe the hackers themselves, takes seriously the political and, philosoph and philosophical implication of hacking and of computers. So basically, this is what we'll try to humbly uh, do here. It might be a little bit complex, like I said before, uh, an abstract for sure, uh, but we really have the feeling that there's something decisive to understand uh, uh, in this movement and in what, it, in what it means uh, generally. We think that understanding that helps us to pick side and, uh, and, uh, and to see that hacking cannot just be limited to a pure idea of a pure practice, a pure skill, a pure technique but a peculiar and rich relationship to the world. So, um, a few years ago, Telecomics, which is a, another hacking group, as you know, uh, um, they, they made, they, I quote them, they said uh, uh, that the reason why, why hackers uh, were ahead of that time was because they didn't consider the internet uh, as, a separate as a separate virtual world, but as an extension of physical reality. And it's even more obvious today uh, when we see hackerspace uh, 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 getting off the screens to just get in, in the streets and just open hackerspace. But um, <clears throat> if we can all agree on the fact that there might not be uh, any distinction to be made between the virtual and the real, we have to acknowledge that uh, behind the virtual world, at its very core, at its very foundation, lies a certain a peculiar ideology that is a peculiar way to apprehend, understand, and make the world real. This way of thinking, this ideology um, that has become real, uh, it has a name, a historical name. It's called cybernetics. 
And it's always pretty funny because when you talk about cybernetics, you, 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 you directly sound like an 80, year, 80 years old person who just doesn't know anything about computer and would just think that. But actually, it's not. I mean, the, the, um, this term, cybernetic, is probably more actual than ever uh, for the reasons I will try to expose. And we have to firstly understand what, what the history of, uh, of uh, cybernetic is. And, and we will see that uh, it, it really enlightened uh, 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 the way the world is organized today and uh, our relationship to computers. Mm. So, sorry again, I'm not speaking too fast. Yeah, I am. All right, sorry. Stress. I'm, I usually speak too fast, but stress is not helping. So, uh, the history is as follows of cybernetics. So in the 1940s, uh, a mathematician, uh, Norbert Weiner, while he was uh, finishing his work for the American army, undertook to establish a new science that will also be a new definition of man, of his relationship with the world and with himself. So there was also Claude Shannon, uh, an engineer at Bell and MIT, who worked on information theory, contributed to the development of telecommunication, uh, and he took part in that project too. As did Gregory Bateson, uh, a Harvard anthropologist uh, employed by the American Secret Service in Southeast uh, Asia during the Second World War. And there was also the truculent uh, uh, John von Neumann, who wrote the first draft of a report on the EDVAC, which is regarded as the founding text of computer science. He was actually the inventor of game theory, which is a decisive uh, uh, contribution to neoliberal economics. He was also a supporter of preventive nuclear strike against the USSR, just for the story. Um, hence, the, the very person who made substantial contribution to the new means of communication and to data processing after the Second World War also laid the basis of that science that Weiner called cybernetics. And he actually took that from Ampère, who one century before had the good idea of defining this science as the science of government. So we're talking about an art of governing whose formative moments are almost forgotten, but whose concepts branched their way underground, feeding into information technology as much as biology, artificial intelligence, management, or cognitive sciences. At the same, at the same time, as, as, it, as it strung cables uh, uh, on the whole surface of the globe. So what cyberneticians believed and somehow created is a world uh, where machines will make all forms of political control unnecessary because computer networks could make ordered society without a centralized control. The idea was that if human beings were linked by webs of computers, they could create together their own kind of order. The feedback of information between all connected individuals in the network could create a self-stabilizing system. This idea came from a peculiar idea of nature, of nature as a, an ecosystem that always self-regulates and self-control itself. And this is that idea uh, 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 that there will be some kind of natural balance that should be and could be achieved in human relationships thanks to computers. So cybernetics uh, is the idea, uh, it's the philosophy, the ontology, the idea of, of being that supposes that uh, everything, that life itself, can be flattened as pure communication, as pure messages. And from there, we will need no gods nor masters, as machines will enable uh, us to control everything and to control ourselves. Calculus and feedback loops will allow real-time control of the world by analyzing and, decipher and deciphering all human behaviors and conducts. <clears throat> So it means that life could be reduced to communication, as I just say, and that it will just require to set this communication free, to let it flow freely for human beings to achieve the highest level of freedom. That's what the hypothesis and the dream of cybernetics. Uh, and so here we, basically, we, we see where this idea comes, this idea comes, comes from. Basically, the circulation of information could be superposed to the circulation of commodities. Life is turned into information that needs to circulate, uh, to, to circulate as equivalents, just like commodities do. Feedback being the key to regulation. So the cybernetic project means firstly separating and flattening life by, by translating it into zero and one, and then reuniting it as a representation 
that is mimicking life. So now we can start to see uh, how uh, the cybernetic hypothesis uh, is the politics of the end of the political. So why will, we, why will we be interested in what the conceivers of computers and the internet said and conceptualized 60 years ago? Simply because this paradigm, this way of thinking, power, social organization, this way of thinking a self-controlled and surveilled world, this paradigm is today the vanguard of government. It is today and it will, even, it will be even more tomorrow. It's not the type of power that faces us, it's the type of power uh, uh, in which we dwell. It is a form of domination in which we live, the environment in which our conducts, desires, and lives are framed. I've got a quote here. Um, just, just to, uh, this quote uh, uh, comes from uh, uh, Jared Cohen, and, and I mean, it comes from uh, the, the new digital age. And uh, it says the following thing. Uh, no, no, sorry, sorry, I'm, I'm wrong. No, I just need to read the code before so you get the funny thing. So the code is this. In Tripoli, Tottenham, or Wall Street, people have been protesting failed policies and the meager possibilities affor afforded by the electoral system. They have lost faith in government and other centralized institutions of power. There is no viable justification for a democratic system in which public participation is limited to voting. We live in a world in which ordinary people, write Wikipedia, spend their evening moving a telescope via the internet and making discoveries half a world away, get online to get to help organize a protest in cyberspace and in the physical world, such as the revolutions in, e in Egypt or Tunisia or the demonstration of the indignados throughout Spain, or pour over the cables revealed by Wikileaks. The same technologies enable us to work together at a distance or creating the expectation to do better at governing ourselves. And so here it's not a, a, an indignados who speaks, it's a, actually a, a someone called Beth Novak, who is actually directing the Open, the open Government Initiative for the Obama uh, administration. Um, <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. Uh, and then another quote from, from the New York City Hall. Uh, uh, in New York, what, what, what the New York City Hall thing is that the hierarchical structure based, based on the notion that the government knows what's good for you is outdated. The new model for this century depends on co-creation and collaboration. So, uh, un unsurprisingly, the, the concept of uh, open government data was formulated not by politicians, but by computer specialists. Um, and were fervent defenders of open source software development, moreover. Uh, and, and they invoked the US founding father conviction that every citizen should take part in government. And here the government is reduced to the role of team leader or facilitator, ult ultim ultimately uh, to that of a platform for coordinating citizen action. <clears throat> and the parallel with social networks is fully embraced. I still quote, how can the city think of itself in the same way Facebook has an API ecosystem or Twitter does? It is a question on the minds of the New York mayor's office again. Um, <clears throat> so even if these declarations are, 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 can be seen as fanciful cogitation and products of somehow uh, overheated brains of Silicon Valley, they still confirm that the practice of government is less and less identified with state sovereignty. In the area of networks, governing means ensuring the interconnection of people, objects, and machines, as well as the free, that means transparent and controllable, circulation of information that is generated in this manner. This is an activity already conducted largely outside the state apparatuses, even if the latter try, uh, uh, try to be by every means to maintain control over it. So it's becoming clear that Facebook is not so much the model of a new form of government as its reality already in operation. Uh, and so, <clears throat> again, I, I will quote again the, the new di digital age. Uh, it says, in the future, people won't just back up their data, they will back up their government. And in case it's just n not clear uh, enough who the boss is, uh, it concludes governments may collapse and wars can destroy physical infrastructure, but virtual institutions will survive. With Google, what is concealed beneath the exterior of an innocent interface and an extremely effective search engine is an explicitly political project. Uh, a company that maps the planet Earth, dispatching its team into every street of every one of its towns, cannot have purely commercial aims. Uh, one never maps a territory uh, that one doesn't contemplate uh, appropriating. 
So of course we could consider cybernetic as pure ideology, but it's not. It's a material, it's a materialized uh, uh, one made of millions of apparatuses that transform relationships to ourselves, to others, and to the world. So we, we believe that cybernetics is actually the new form that government takes. It is a new form of government, actually. By government, we don't mean the actual governance uh, that are regularly elected by a particular way to, uh, that are regularly elected, but government in terms of uh, uh, this, this particular way to exercise power. To govern is not to impose a discipline to a body, nor to enforce the law in a precise territory. To govern is something different. It's a, it's a, it's a different political technique. It's all about conducting, leading the conducts and behaviors of a, of a population. It's taking care of the population like a shepherd of its herd to maximize its potential and orientate, guide its freedom. It's all about taking into account and designing its desires, its habits, its fears, its ways of thinking, and its milieu. It's about deploying a whole set of tactics, of discursive tactics, of material tactics, to pay the finest attention to popular uh, emotions and feelings. It's all about acting on the environment to continuously modify its variables, to act on a few to influence the actions of others, to maintain the control of, of the herd. It's basically like waging a war without, with, with, without the least possible violence, a war of influence, subtle, refined, psychological, and, and, and indirect. So, I'm sorry, I just need to drink. So, up until, uh, up until recently, this technique of power, uh, that is government, was endorsed by what was called political economy. What we think is that today we witness the downfall of political economy and its replacement by cybernetic. Cybernetic can be seen as a savior of a declining global capitalism. Economics have never been a reality or a science. Uh, from its inception in the, uh, in the 17th century, it's never been anything but an art of governing population. Scarcity had to be avoided if riots were to be avoided. So, to quote uh, Hamilton, the surest way for all government is to rely on the interests of men. So, <clears throat> once the natural laws of economy were elucidated, governing meant, meant letting its harmonious mechanism operate freely and moving men by, manipula by manipulating their interests. <clears throat> so, harmony, the pre predictability of behaviors, a radiant future, an assumed rationality of the actors, all this implied a certain trust, the ability to give credit. That's the whole story of economy. But what we witness today is that the worldwide crisis is just pulverizing this old perception and this dependence on trust. And somehow, that is not really a problem, the end of trust uh, as a cement to capitalism can be replaced by cybernetic control. Where control and transparency reign, where the subject's behavior is anticipated in real time through the algorithmic processing of, processing of a mass of available data about them, so there's no more need to trust them and for them to trust. It's sufficient that they be sufficiently monitored. As Lenin said, trust is good, control is better. So cybernetics developed on that open wound uh, of modernity. It has hurted itself as a remedy for the existential and those government, governmental crises of the West. Cybernetic government is inherently apocalyptic. It has no project in the future, no positive idea on life. Its purpose is to locally manage and control, create stability, and eventually produce a perpetual self-regulation of systems through the unrestrained, transparent, and controllable circulation of information. So to quote Viner again, communi communi communication is a cement of society, and those who work, uh, whose work consists in keeping the channels of communication open are the ones on whom the continuance or downfall of our civilization largely depends. So, just as uh, political economy produced uh, uh, homo economicus, uh, uh, people were just manageable uh, 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 by the framework of the industrial states, cybernetics is producing its own humanity. A transparent humanity emptied out by the very flows that traverse it, electrified by information, and attached to the world by an ever-growing quantity of, of apparatuses. A humanity that's inseparable from its technological environment because it is constituted and thus driven by that. Such is, the, uh, is the, uh, the object of government now. No longer man or his interests, but his social environment. Poli political economy ranked over beings by leaving them free to pursue their interests. Cybernetics controls them by leaving them free to communicate. 
And behind the, the, the futuristic promise of a world of fully linked people and objects, when cars, fridges, watches, vacuums, and dildos are directly connected to each other and to the internet, there is what is already here, the fact that the most polyvalent of sensor is already in operation, that is myself. I share my geolocation, my mood, my opinions, my performance numbers, and their self-evaluation. I always post photos of my vacations, my evenings, my riots, my colleagues, of what I'm do going to eat, of who I'm going to fuck. I appear not to do much, and yet I produce a steady stream of data. Whether I work or not, my everyday life is a stock of information, a stock of data that is valuable on the market of cybernetic capitalism. The great, the great refrigerated storehouses of data are the pantry of current government. In its remaging, through the databases produced and continuously updated by the everyday life of connected humans, it looks for the correlations it can, it can use to establish not universal laws, nor even whys, but rather whens and whats. The state, ambitions, uh, the state ambition of cybernetics is to, manage to uh, is to manage the unforeseeable and to govern the ungovernable instead of trying to destroy it. And of course, the, the object of the great harvest of personal information is not an individualized tracking of the whole population. Uh, if the surveillance uh, insinuates themselves into the intimate life of each, of each and every person, it's not so much to construct individual files as to assemble massive databases that makes numerical sense. It, it is more efficient to correlate the shared characteristics of individuals in a multitude of profiles with the probable development they suggest. One is not interested in the individual, present and entire, but only in what, what makes it possible to determine their potential, their potential line of flight. And this is where we understand why Google is a war machine. The, <clears throat> the advantage of uh, applying the surveillance to profiles, events, and virtualities is that statistical entities don't take offense, and individuals can still claim they are not being monitored, or, or at least not personally. Um, while cybernetic governmentality uh, already operates in terms of a completely new logic, uh, its subject continues to think of themselves according to the old paradigm. We believe that our, that our personal data belong to us, like our car and our shoes, and that we're only exercising our individual freedom by deciding to let Google, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, or whatever, or the police have access to them, without realizing that this has immediate effects on those who refuse to and will be treated for, uh, for, uh, from, from then on as suspects, as potential deviants. So just like, again, the new digi digital age puts it, uh, so I quote again, there will, there will be people who resist adopting and using technology. People who want nothing to do with virtual profiles, online data systems, or smartphones. Yet, a government might suspect that people who opt out completely have something to hide, and thus, are more likely to break laws. And as counterterrorism measure, measures, that government will build the kind of hidden people registry we described earlier. If you don't have any registered social networking profiles or mobile, or mobile subs, uh, subscriptions and online references to your, unu, to your unusually hard to find, you might be considered a candidate for such a registry. You might also be subjected to a strict set, set of new regulations that includes rigorous airport screening or even travel restrictions. So, this is where we, we, we see a, a divide going through the, the hacker movement. There are those who hack against government, against governmentality, against cybernetics, and there are those who want a better transparency, who want a, dem a democratic control over control. Those who pursue the dream of cybernetic world where life can be reduced and self-managed by good algorithms. So, of course, who owns the internet? To what extent do illegal surveillance go are real and important issues, but they're not sufficient. Um, there, are in, there are some way at the tip of the iceberg. What could make us miss that a new form of power is holding us? And most of all, this way of revealing what will be hidden by companies and governments should not make us believe that the solution should be a general transparency. Which was, for instance, uh, the political horizon uh, of the Pirate Party. The Pirate Party program was just about pushing the cybernetical ideology further. Our problem with cybernetic cannot be uh, that, the, the, that the people who actually, the problem is not the people who actually own the key to the networks and to our data. What makes cybernetics the enemy of freedom is rather its flattened and fully controlled idea of, of what life should be. So let's take an, an example, for instance. Uh, uh, you remember probably the, the riots in, uh, in Tottenham and you know, in, in London in 2011. 
and in France at least, maybe it was the same thing uh, uh, in some other places, uh, in France, um, some uh, uh, old newspapers said, oh yeah, you know, it's a, it's a revolt, of, uh, it's a Twitter revolt. Uh, and actually, uh, uh, the rioters used uh, blackberries and not Twitter. So, uh, but but uh, but what actually Twitter helped organize uh, uh, around those 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 popular riots? Uh, uh, what what was what was called uh, the citizen sweepers, uh, who volunteered to sweep up and repair the damage caused by the confrontation and looting. And that initiative was relayed and coordinated by uh, something called Crisis Commons, uh, whose job is, I quote, a global network of volunteers working together to build and use technology tools to help respond to disasters and improve resiliency and response before a crisis. So what we see here is that uh, uh, cybernetic tools can as much be used to support a revolt than to suppress it. That's the point I wanted to make. And in the same way, uh, uh, we can look at some of the utopias uh, uh, that have been produced by last year's uh, social movements. And for instance, some Spanish indignados, uh, uh, for them, what they say, and I quote again, for them, the social computer networks uh, uh, had not only accelerated the spread of the 2011 movements, but also, and more importantly, had set the terms of a new type of political organization for the struggle and for society, a connected, participatory and transparent democracy. And somehow here, the point I want to make is that uh, we could feel a little bit ill at ease to see that uh, uh, there's so much in common between the type of utopia that uh, uh, presents itself as revolutionary and the one upheld by Jared Cohen, Cohen and Eric Schmidt when on the first page of their book, The New Digital Age, again, uh, you can read, the internet is the largest experiment involving anarchy in history. So what we need is not transparency, uh, it is actually opacity. If we want to build and use tools that allow us to secure, uh, uh, to, to allow us secure an anony anonymous access to the internet, it's not to defend the network, it's to defend ourselves on the network and from those who own and control it. An internet that provides anonymity and confidentiality of communication is not the internet, it's a political operation against the internet as a control device. We, we should remember this cruel uh, uh, sentence from Edward Snowden. Uh, he said, I quote, the greatest fear that I have is that nothing will change. People will see in the media all of these disclosures. They will know the lengths that the government is going to grant themselves powers unilaterally to create greater control over American society and global society, but they won't be willing to take the risks necessary to stand up and fight. And actually, this is what happened. I mean, nothing happened. So it's not to say that the somehow journalistic task of revealing corruption, mass surveillance, etc., is not useful. It's, it surely is, but only because it enables us to protect ourselves from, from it. What I mean is that knowing the NSA is spying on everyone doesn't produce any freedom. It doesn't produce autonomy or bring down governments. Uh, to quote an old friend, it's not truth that will destroy a world of lies, but a world of truth. It doesn't make life quali qualitatively better. It just helps us to know what we have to do to create zone of opacity, to keep our activities hidden from, governments, from government panopticon. The only reason why anyone will oppose a surveillance state uh, is not for the sake of it or for some uh, abstract uh, idea of uh, privacy or, or, or freedom. Nobody does that. The, 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 and, and what will be the point of hiding our preferences for Coke or Pepsi from the big data vacuum? The, the cybernetic power always wants what's best for us and it actually knows it better than us. So no, the only reason why one will actually fight against surveillance is because of the potential, of the, of the potential criminal character of its activities. And this is something that is fully assumable. When you want to subvert the existing order, uh, the existing social relationship, which uh, seems to be the main objective of uh, Anonymous and, and the hacking world, uh, you ultimately end up with the police trying to stop you. <clears throat> so what I mean is that we never fight for an abstract idea of freedom. Nobody does that. We fight to disrupt the status quo. And it is in this very process that lies freedom. Freedom is never the objective. It is the fight itself. So I, I will go to the last part of my speech. Uh, yeah, so yeah, I will, I will end up uh, uh, um, so I can clarify what, what, uh, what, uh, what I think is really rich in the, in the hacker movement uh, uh, and, and how it helps clarify huge questions for the global revolutionary movement. 
For at least uh, 150 years, uh, the revolutionary movement uh, has been divided around, uh, around the question of technique and technology. To summarize the debate, you had, uh, on one hand, uh, uh, we could say the technophiles, uh, uh, which were basically around Marxism, who saw that the machines would help us uh, uh, being free, and it would be the condition to the global emancipation. And on the other side, uh, uh, you had the, the uh, let's say, uh, technophobic people, uh, who will believe that alienation was rooted uh, uh, in, in technique and technology itself. But somehow, technophilia and technophobia uh, are the, the, the two sides of the same coin. And this is what, what, what the hacker movement helps us, uh, helps us understand. Uh, what they do have in common, technophilia and technophobia, uh, uh, is that they share uh, a same false belief uh, that such a thing as technique exists, that a pure technique will exist. So it will be possible uh, in human existence to divide between what is technical and what is not. Well, in fact, it's not possible. Uh, no such thing as a pure technique exists. Uh, you only have to look at the state of incompletion in which the human offspring is born and the time it takes for it to move uh, in the world and to talk, to realize uh, that uh, its relation to the world is not given in the least. It's rather the result of a whole elaboration. Man's relation to the world is not the result of a natural compatibility. It is essentially artificial, that is, technical, to speak Greek. So each human world is a certain configuration of techniques, of culinary techniques, architectural techniques, musical techniques, spiritual techniques, informational, agricultural, erotic, martial, whatever. All the, 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 the human world is always technique. There's no generic human nature or essence because there are only particular techniques and because every technique configures a world, a relationship to this world. <clears throat> And that is also why our familiar world really appears to us as technical, because a set of artifices that structure it are already part of us. It's rather those we're not familiar with that seems to have a strange artificiality. Uh, the only moment where we, where we feel the world is, is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is, is artificial is when we make an innovation on where, or when something breaks down. <clears throat> so techniques can be reduced to a collection of equivalent instruments that a generic man could just take up and use without his essence being affected. Every tool configures and embodies a particular relation with the world and the worlds formed in this way are not equivalent any more than the humans who inhabit them are. And that's why we cannot hierarchize those worlds. There is nothing that will establish some as more advanced than others. They are merely distinct, uh, each having its own potential and its own history. Of course, the Western ideology of progress implicitly introduced a criterion to hierarchize world. And it's actually a pretty simple one. It's the productivity of the techniques. Consider the part from what each technique might involve ethically without regard to the sensible world it engenders. This is why there's no progress but capitalist progress. And why capitalism is the uninterrupted, uninterrupted destruction of worlds. So this is why technophiles and technophobics fail to grab the ethical nature of every technique. In order to hierarchize walls, uh, a criterion has to be introduced, an implicit criterion making it possible to classify the different techniques. In the case of progress, this criterion is simply the quantifiable. It's, it's the productivity of the techniques considered apart from what each technique involves ethically. Without, uh, <clears throat> And so... So in that sense, uh, capitalism is, is essentially technological. It is a profitable organization of the most productive techniques into a system. Its cardinal figure is not the economist, but the engineer. The engineer is a specialist in techniques and thus the chief expropriator of them, one who doesn't let himself be affected by any of them and spread his own absence from the world everywhere he can. He's a sad and servile figure. The figure of the hacker contrasts point by point with the figure of the engineer. Whatever the artistic, police-directed, or entrepreneurial efforts to neutralize, to neutralize him may be. Whereas the engineer will capture everything that functions in such a manner that everything functions better in order to place it in the service of the system, the hacker asks himself, how does that work? In order to find its flows, but also to invent other uses, to experiment. Experimenting, then, means exploring what such and such a technique implies ethically, what relation to the world it enables or disables. The hacker 
pulls technique out of the technological system in order to free them. If we're slaves of, uh, to technology, this is precisely because there is a whole ensemble of artifacts of our, every, of our everyday existence that we, take to be specific, that we take to be specifically technical and that we will always regard simply as black boxes of which we're the innocent users. Understanding how any of the devices that surround us works allow us to see them not as mere environments, but as a world arranged in a certain way and one that we can shape. This is the hacker's perspective on the world. And this past few years, the hacker's milieu has gained some sophistication politically, managing to identify uh, friends and enemies more clearly. But as we said earlier, uh, there's still some confusions to clarify. In 1986, Dr. Crash wrote, whether you know it or not, if you're a hacker, you're a revolutionary. Don't worry, you're on the right side. It's not certain that this sort of innocence is still possible. Uh, we have to remember that it's actually a hacker who uh, just gave out uh, uh, Jeremy Hammond to the cops. In the hacker milieu, uh, uh, there's uh, an original illusion according to which freedom of information, freedom of the internet, or freedom of the individual can be set against those who are bent on controlling them. And this is a serious misunderstanding. Freedom and surveillance, freedom and the panoptical belong to the same paradigm of government. Historically, the endless expansion of control procedures is a corollary of a form of power that is realized through the freedom of individuals. As we exposed earlier, liberal government is not one that is exercised directly on the bodies of its subjects or that expects their obedience. It's a background power which prefers to manage space and rule over interests rather than bodies, a power that oversees monitors and acts minimally, intervening only when the, frame, when the framework is threatened. Government is that order which one obeys like one eats when hungry and covers oneself when cold. So for the individual, uh, monitored freedom is the only kind there is. That is and this is what libertarians will never understand. Uh, a genuinely free being is not even said to be free. It simply is. It exists. It deploys its power according to its being. We say of an animal that it is roaming free only when it lives in an environment that's already completely controlled, fenced, and civilized. Uh, in English, friend and free uh, and, and freund and frei uh, in German come from the same Indo-European root, which conveys the idea of a shared power that grows. Being free and having ties was one and the same thing. I am free because I have ties, because I am linked to a reality greater than me, not because I'm alone on my own. Freedom is not the act of shedding or attachment, but the practical capacity to work on them, to move around in the space, to form or dissolve them. The freedom to uproot oneself has always been a, phantas a phantasmatic and empty freedom. So to conclude this talk, there have been many hacking attacks that so many of us have, have uploaded those last years. And the stake is, of course, to always bring them further and to not uh, 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 let those who get arrested alone facing repression. Uh, it's pretty clear uh, where the strength of hacking lies. We need to multiply a zone of opacity uh, from where we can experiment without being cocked. And we need clouds of attacks uh, against the infrastructures of control and surveillance. And of course, Attacking an infrastructure doesn't mean purely destroying it, but also means learning how to inhabit it uh, differently, how to snatch it from its actual use, and how to reappropriate it for the construction of our worlds. Uh, just to sum it up, uh, a world doesn't have an infrastructure, uh, it has a way and a form. That's it. <laughs> sorry, it was long. Just for, for those who might be interested, sorry, just one last thing. Uh, two things. Uh, Basically, most of what I, a big part of what I said uh, uh, came from a, 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 so a chapter of this book that I was, that I was speaking about, which is called uh, To Our Friends. And I actually have copies in English and German for those one of this very chapter, which is probably more clear and less boring to read than to hear. Uh, so uh, I, I will have some there if you want. And also at 10, uh, 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 there are some people here who are organizing a, a workshop and the whole 14 to discuss, to discuss those issues that have been discussed here. So I invite everybody who has been interested to go at 10 tonight at whole 14. All right, thanks for the talk so far. We actually have uh, 15 minutes for Q&A, so if you have uh, questions or comments, please uh, get in line at these microphones. Um, uh, please note that uh, please only one comment or one question at a time. So uh, I guess uh, we can start uh, with microphone number four. Okay, hi, thanks. Um, very, very complex talk you gave there with a lot of philosophy in it. Um, but um, just back on the idea of engineer versus hacker, you say like the engineer is 
using technology or making technology a slave of the system, how you expressed it. And the hacker is different in a way that he um, tries to understand the, the, the technique and uh, tries to use it in different ways. I don't know which kind of engineer you meant there, but I, I don't think that you can differentiate in this way. As like a mechanical engineer doesn't just uh, use techni technique to, for like a slaving of the system or whatever. It's more like an understanding as well and using it in a different way. Maybe not like a hacker, but still not just you know enslaving it. I, 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 I think I get your question, but I, I don't really hear it very well there. But I guess you say that uh, my, my, my critic of uh, engineer uh, was too uh, omnilateral, is what he said. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, I guess the point here that I was trying to make uh, is not to say that uh, all engineers in the world individually are evil person, but that the figure uh, of the engineers, the job of the engineer, uh, uh, is to make a system work, while the, the, the difference with the figure of the hacker is not to how to make it work better, but to understand understand how it works to be able to actually change its use. So that's, that's, that's what the point of the, of the c c comparison. Does that answer your question? Yeah, well, but then there's this what I, what I say, you know, I think it's not that way because an engineer much more uses the, the stuff he learns to create something new or something that, or, you know, use a technique in a different way. So there's a lot of similarity between what a hacker does or what an engineer does. Just that you do it on different suspects if you want. I mean, I don't think it's the same thing when you work for, when you're an engineer in Google and when you just uh, set up an attack against Stratfor, you know, I don't think you actually really do the same thing, you know? I mean, there's like a big difference, uh, no? In terms of uh, what you're fighting for uh, or against or whatever, you know? Yeah. All right, so let's uh, make sure we get uh, other questions too. Um, we have one question from the internet at least. Yes, uh, got, got two actually. Uh, I'll start with the funniest one. Uh, are you French? No, I'm not. Okay, but no, otherwise, uh, the guy say that your English is perfect. Oh, thanks a lot. <laughs> All right, uh, microphone number two, please. Hi, thank you for your uh, talk. Um, what I found in your uh, presentation was that the granularity was in individual and government. But due to my work, I also see uh, a lot of um, attacks about criminal organizations which have budgets ranging into the millions, which also use the same techniques for uh, blackmailing, uh, holding people ransom. How does this uh, fit into your story? Um, I, I think, uh, 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 I guess most, uh, ma I mean, I think government is just the mafia that's one over all the other mafias, you know? And, and so, uh, you know, so we're just the smartest one, but. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, microphone number one. Um, yes, I'm wondering actually, um, it ties into the question that just came. You kind of like picture many things in terms of some individual and the government. But then we also, and especially when you talk about hackers, there is also something like, uh, like, like many, many communities, right? I mean, there's the hacking. We are all meeting here. But if you walk around the hall here, you will find like tons of sub-realities where people are doing all kinds of weird stuff, you know, and interesting stuff. And, they're, and on many different levels, actually, they're hacking at things. Like kind of like economy related or political related or some security system and so on. But still it's you you kind of like identify this kind of hacker view or perspective or something as a distinct way of being in the world, right? And and still what I'm not getting is how are you transforming all of these thoughts and all of these multitudes that are around into how do you connect it to some kind of action? You know? I, I, actually, it's, it's uh, uh, my job was was to talk, not to connect all those. But although I would really, really much like to do it, but I, I, I guess I don't have the, 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 that power, unfortunately, or maybe fortunately. Uh, but uh, uh, I guess uh, 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 um, I think w one of the interests of, uh, of such a, a meeting here with so many people doing, as you said, so many different things on so many different levels, is actually to be able to have debates, like political debates about, uh, about uh, what makes sense, what doesn't, and, and basically what, what is the, you know, I talk about ethics uh, in, my, in my speech, and ethics is not a, a big word, just that uh, uh, what is uh, our idea of uh, freedom and joy or whatever, this is the ethic of the world, and, and so uh, uh, being able to, um, to, uh, 
to uh, to uh, to uh, to figure out what sh which are the different uh, positions that exist uh, in this milieu. How can the, and because things things are being done. I mean, uh, uh, in in Tottenham, uh, uh, in London, the, the example I was given given uh, at some point, uh, the police the police didn't have the encryption code for Blackberries, uh, and of course Blackberry were like, okay, we're going to give it to you. But what happened is that some hackers just uh, uh, threatened uh, Blackberry to uh, to uh, to hack them and to reveal their, their encryption code, which will make their, their phones useless. And so they didn't give the encryption codes to the police uh, to help people who actually might have been arrested. But the, so I guess that the the the, the connection with, uh, with with what is happening outside of the hacker milieu is is, is always going. And I, and I think for the last years, what we've seen is that it, it has been improving and and and, uh, and uh, intensifying a lot. So uh, I, I guess we just have to need to to still uh, go in that way. So would you see the, the communication that you are proposing, the way the language you're proposing to talk about things and the views, would you see this as some kind of, this kind of debate and discourse and whatnot, this is kind of like the ground on which several actions in like all kinds of ways can happen? But basically, it's important to find some kind of language to and ethics to actually relate. Uh, it's, it's it's just a, a way to try to uh, to open a discussion with whoever uh, is willing to 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 have it. Uh, number two. Okay, so if I understood you correctly, then um, you said that in a cybernetic society, things work too mechanical, and that also the pirate party, for example, failed because it lacked a vision somehow. Now, my question would be, in your opinion, what, be, what would be a good vision and what would be good goals for a political party? I don't believe in political party. Sorry. I, <laughs> I guess that. Thank you. Uh, number four. Uh, to, just to answer, actually, it was not a way not to answer, but uh, I believe that uh, uh, today what we need to do is uh, to uh, get organized by ourselves uh, uh, with our own means and, and, and locally and, and linked with everyone else. So it's not a, I think that there, is, uh, there are ways and there's always been historically ways to get organized outside of political parties and outside of all the uh, political hypocrisy. And I think that's the way to go. And I think that is what a lot of people do spontaneously in the world today. Um, you, uh, you mentioned that those who opt out uh, to share the data and to be on Facebook and Google uh, maybe become suspect or suspicious and they uh, face tougher restrictions maybe. Do you have a suggestion how to deal with that? How uh, it, to it, opt out and still uh, not be... Uh, uh, it's, it's not me who said it, it's actually uh, uh, Jared Cohen uh, and Eric Schmidt in their books called The New Digital Age. You know, so you know who they are. You know, uh, they're a Google CEO and, uh, and uh, uh, someone important in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, the, in the American defense. Uh, and it is them who just, uh, who just uh, explains that. And, and of course, we, we can really easily believe that uh, it will happen in the, in the coming years. Uh, the, the, uh, honestly, uh, Beside uh, propagating uh, uh, ways for more and more people to be uh, uh, anonymous, just like Tails or Tor uh, are doing, just seems to be to to be the only way, actually, I guess, to to, to escape. I mean, I, I don't think that we can we can uh, uh, be like, oh, we're not going to use the internet at all uh, in the coming year or, or a phone or whatever. I mean, we will. Just the question is, how do we make sure? I mean, how do we do the best that we can uh, uh, so that we maintain zone of opacity uh, uh, on uh, on the networks? Okay, thank you. All right, we have another question from the internet. Um, you mentioned that some people might use technology uh, as, for example, cell phones or social media and um, to, to fight a kind of blacklist and censorship. And, but some people are not willing to use these technologies. So what could they do? <laughs> it's up to them. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know. I, I don't have any clear. Uh, I mean, I, I honestly, personally, I, I don't think that uh, uh, all the upheavals uh, in the world that have happened for the last five years were because of social media. But I think that social media is our way sometimes uh, uh, to make uh, to make uh, this happen. But you know, there's a story about uh, Algeria. Uh, uh, I think it was uh, in the late 90s. There was a huge riot in Kabylia, and uh, the way the the the, the riots will will uh, actually spread is that uh, you know it's made of. Uh, uh, small
small uh, hills and, uh, and people in, in one place after some uh, kids were shot by the police uh, will set on fire uh, the, the, the police station and the people on the other side of the, of, the, of the hill will just see the smoke and see that the people there will be attacking the police and then they will them attack the police again and on and on and on uh, up until uh, the whole Algeria was just uh, set on fire. So I guess before, and they didn't have the internet, so basically they managed to find ways to communicate and to know what was going on. So we do not purely, obviously and, and happily uh, uh, depend on, uh, on, uh, on social media and, and on the internet. All right, I think number four was next. I don't know how to say this in like less than five minutes, but... Um, it would be nice if you did. Yeah, I try. So col collaboration is really hard. And I mean, a lot of technology like political parties is used for, for collaboration between humans to, to get some sort of society going that allows us to um, specialize with our jobs and like have this life and whatever, blah, blah, blah. And that takes five minutes. Um, and I mean, one important part is hacking and political activism and revolution or whatever when things go wrong. But on the other hand, you also do need collaboration and stability to have some sort of foundation to, to base that on. And I, I feel like what you're saying is that we only need uh, um, anarchy and, 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 and revolution to, to function, but that, that, that doesn't feel right to me. Can you comment on that? Uh, I think you, you make a really strange uh, anthropology, uh, anthropological point, which is that uh, human beings could only live and would have only lived uh, uh, under uh, power structures, which I don't think is true. So uh, I don't know what to say. I mean, you, you start from the point that uh, we will need to be governed, uh, uh, whatever would happen. And I, I think it's, it's not true historically, and I, I don't think it's not desirable either. But uh, so I, I, I don't really know what to answer. It's either, I, I think that your 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 what you presuppose. Pre pre suppose uh, is not true. true. All right, there's, there's three more persons uh, in line, so that's probably the maximum we, we will be able to take. So uh, number two, please. Hi. Um, first off, thanks very much for not televising or recording this talk. I think that definitely helps the environment. For this talk, for this topic you're talking about in a very positive way, it makes it easier to, uh, to engage with you and ask questions. Um, but very simply, I'm curious, you said you were, um, um, th that you, you don't believe in political parties. I'm just curious, do you uh, think voting, I mean, despite that, do you, do, you, do you also think voting is, do you think voting can sometimes be useful and ethical, or do you think voting is, um, across the board, futile and un un unethical? Uh, it's it's a really abstract question you ask. I mean, uh, uh, if you yeah, ask me, concrete. yeah, yeah, no. But uh, I mean, what I mean is that uh, if you ask me uh, uh, if it makes sense, if I if I do I vote uh, for elections? Honestly, I have never voted in my life, so no. But uh, if you ask me uh, uh, if uh, I think that uh, uh, in some uh, context uh, 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 it's important to have everyone's advice to uh, to, uh, to, uh, to 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 agree on a decision, yes, I do. It's really important, and so uh, uh, I mean, basically, the problem with vote is that. Uh, 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 it makes us believe uh, uh, that this will be the only way uh, for us to agree or disagree uh, on things. While I think there are thousands uh, uh, different ways that that happen at, at every at every moment in life. Uh, so, but I do not really believe in representative democracy. If that uh, question. Merci bien. Uh, number four. Um, I kind of have the same question as the guy who was in front of me. Uh, but I'll, st I'll say it in a little bit stronger way. Uh, so your revolution is successful, the government is gone. Now you have uh, Blackwater, G4S, a uh, bunch of mafias are growing up and now they want to start another government. How You have 48 hours before the people start to starve and how are you going to set up a system, unsystem? What is it going to look like after the revolution is successful. Thank you. Uh, so that, that's a real interesting question. Um, uh, but also it's put in a, in a pretty strange way because I think that this question has never been posed in history this way. Because most of the time, you know, when a, when a, uh, uh, when a government is defeated, uh, it's not defeated uh, from a second to the next. It's defeated after people get organized together. People uh, manage to, I mean, if you take Paris 68, you know, at some point the pigeons give, uh, give uh, money to the, to the people on strike, etc. Et and so the, the bet is that the very process of overthrowing government is also what gives us uh, 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 
uh, the hints of how to get organized differently. And, and because what we know that, you know, what happens in a, uh, you know, there's a, a really famous quote from a Courbet during the Paris Commune where he just writes to his mother and he's like, oh, you know, Paris Commune, you know, and, and, and he, he writes to his mother and he's like, oh, you know, Paris has never been so beautiful. Life has never been so, so easy. People are like uh, uh, good to each other. And the belief is that when uh, the normal situation, the normal situation of power is just uh, 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 when, when you enter a state of exception, actually uh, uh, you end up, you have to, uh, to uh, uh, behave in a different manner than uh, during the, the, the normal way. So, and, and you know, the reason why your question is tricky is that there's a long revolutionary tradition uh, of Marxist sucks, which was like, oh, the revolution is going to be this and that and this and that. And of course, uh, every time it goes, it goes a little bit astray, it's just like they just kill people and they're like, yes, it was for the sake of revolution. Uh, I, we do not come from this uh, uh, political, I mean, we come from a political uh, 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 tradition uh, that takes its roots in, in uh, more in the Paris Commune and uh, uh, in Spain, 36, uh, and maybe in, uh, in uh, May 68, and, and in, in in, in, in the fact that we believe in the uh, uh, autonomous uh, capacity of people to get organized by themselves and not to starve. I mean, no people has ever starved uh, 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 because they were left alone by the government. Government have, have starved people to death a lot of times. But people by themselves, when there's no government, they handle themselves. And, I, and it's, it's, not, it's not a crazy belief. I mean, people can handle their shit to, to, by themselves. I mean, it's, it's, it's true. <laughs> Okay, I'm sorry, but we're running out of time. So, um, thanks again for your talk. Thanks a lot. Uh, I guess if you want to discuss further, just uh, come over here. Yeah, definitely. And I've got the papers for those ones. I mean, if people are still willing.